Welcome back to Good News Covenant County with uh, Brother John, Cousin Jared over there behind the camera operating the sound and everything. It's always mentioning his name so that if anything goes bad, I can say it's his fault. It's not mine. He's a producer. I'm just the talent. And obviously there ain't no talent here. <laughs> but I've got a special guest today, a fellow that I've looked up to for a long time. But more than that, I just think of him as a really good friend and a good human being. Well, thank you. That's Mr. John Gavan over here. Thank you. Uh, John Gavan, I've known, I've known him almost, well, when I came back from college, uh, you had just moved here. I came back from college in 73. Yeah, and I, we moved here in 72. Right. And uh, uh, I've known him ever since. Uh, I've known him socially and uh, otherwise. Sold him one of the first computers I ever sold. Uh, had the company came over there and assembled it on Christmas morning, uh, a, I, a million years ago. And look at look at what it's done, Johnny, and the rest of them are all kind of very computer literate. Yeah, I'm not, but they well, are. that doesn't matter. You know, I, 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 you know, I talked with Jared for five minutes, and after. 30 seconds of that five minutes, I'm already in oblivion. I don't know what he's talking about, but he's moving on trucking. Uh, what a lot of people, you know, a lot of people know John from his law practice here in Andalusia and from some other things. He's been real active in the community. He's a, a, a been a, a, a great advocate for veterans and veterans affairs, not just in Andalusia, but in the wiregrass. He's been active in I think pretty active in, in, in some of the things that have gone over at Fort Rucker with that museum over there. And I've, I've seen uh, John in action doing a lot of things. But John's a, you know, he's the salt of the earth. He's a, he's a local Alabama product. He's from up in Safford, Alabama. Uh, and uh, not, married. Not Sanford, but Safford. Safford, S A F F O R D, over there by Orville. And, and, and Safford's even got its own zip code, 36773. He's up there by Uniontown and Orville and the spot. Some yes. of the best uh, dove hunting you'll ever see if you get it on a good day up there. Used to be the spot to eat. Back in those days when I was a kid, see, before the interstate, uh, Birmingham to Mobile came right through Safford, right through Highway Safford. 5. That's right. The spot to eat was our local finest, very fine. And that's where a lot of people stopped. It was stopped. the only one, wasn't it, John? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people stopped halfway on the way, you know, between Mobile and, and uh, Birmingham. I, at this time, it, it's, it's kind of unusual as John about, and I have gotten to know each other better, especially the last three or four years. Uh, it found out what a small world it is. I, I had done a lot of work in the agricultural business up in that part of the state. And as we talk and talk and talk, we continued to discover uh, people that had, we had known mutually for years and never known that uh, we could have had some conversations about some of them while they were alive. Right. And uh, it, one of his best friends was a guy that I had known, Herman Majors up there, just as fine a person as a good Lord ever put on the face of this earth. I met him. When we were five years old, uh, his parents moved in with their parents, which was on a farm adjoining our farm, five mm -hmm. miles north of Safford. And uh, Herman comes walking down the road on a very hot July day with a little straw hat on. I don't know why I remember that so vividly, but he had sweat running down his face and that's when Herman Majors and I met. We were about five years old apiece and uh, we've been in the hay field ever since. That's right. I, I think you put yourself through college cutting hay. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I bailed a few square bales of hay. Right. Now John uh, went to uh, school there and, and, and where'd you graduate from high school? Uh, I went to Orville, Orville High School grades one through ten then I graduated from high school 11 through 12 at Marion Military Institute. That's what I thought you went to MMI. Uh, and that's right up the road, too. Uh, and John then went to Auburn and got his degree, learned how to, went to the Army. Young men used to come out of high school and college, and there was no doubt about whether they what they were going to do. They were going to go into the Army. I remember 
so many of my classmates in class 69, and even the earlier years, I think it was even more predominant. What you gonna do when you get out of college? Well, I guess I'm gonna go in the Navy for a while or the Army or something like that. Many of them would learn a trade, but it was almost felt like there was a, all of our fathers had served in World War II or grandfathers in World War I, and there was almost a sense of uh, an obligatory feeling that you had to go and serve your country. That's not true anymore, uh, but uh, that, was, uh, that was what went on, I'm sure, in, in Safford and uh, Uniontown and Orville. Well, my mother had five brothers in World War II, and that, you know, that registered with me forever. She had five brothers in World War II, and not a one of them got a scratch. Thank goodness for and, that. And they were all in combat zones. I knew I knew that uh, a couple of them had been. I didn't know that they had all been, but they were. Uh, uh, World War II was truly a uh, a war where the entire nation fought. Exactly. Uh, I'm of the personal opinion: if you're gonna get it in invo involved in a war, if you can't get everybody in it, to, then don't put anybody in it. But that's enough. We're gonna take a break, and then we're gonna come back and talk about John's books. Good News Covenant County comes back to you with Brother John, Cousin Jared, our production genius, and Mr. John Gavan, a friend of mine. Now, when we left a minute ago before the advertising, we were talking about the military and how many of the people, especially in the South, I think, felt an obligation to go and serve in the military. And that was, uh, you went in, what, 65? No, I went in in 1962. 62, okay. June of 62 was when I was commissioned a second lieutenant out of Auburn, and I went directly on active duty. Yeah. And uh, in the course of that, I think you uh, you learned to fly a helicopter. Oh, yeah. Learned to fly five of them. Yeah. And uh, uh, I spent, was it was just one tour in Vietnam. Yeah, I got, to, I got to Vietnam, arrived in Vietnam on my 23rd birthday, September 19th, 1963, and I was wounded on April 12th, 1964, and flown out of Vietnam to Clark Air Force Base Hospital. On, in the Philippines. In the Philippines on April 17th. And uh, uh, as a result of that, you lost a leg, right. it's, isn't that right? And, uh, uh, but he had a, he, John's got a great memory, and, and he's, taking the time to write about some of his adventures. He's talked with me about when my oldest son was at uh, uh, in San Antonio uh, at Fort Sam. Yeah. Uh, going through the uh, medics course and that kind of stuff. Uh, John was telling me about when he was there and that they were in the wards and they didn't have a speck of air conditioning and how miserable. Yeah, I was, at, anyway, but. I was at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, and uh, from about May of 63 till I was honorably discharged in October 60, no, 64, not 63, 64. And uh, Brook Army Hospital was known for its burn ward, and that was in the main brick building. Still is. Yeah, but they had a orthopedic ward which was a two-story wood building that sat down the street, sort of across the track, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And I was housed there along with other Vietnam veterans who'd been wounded and other servicemen. You know, back then they had these big war games every summer. Right. And I remember when I was in there, there were more people wounded and messed up in war games than they were from Vietnam. Of course, keeping it early, keeping in mind this was early, early in the conflict. Yeah. But anyway, to make a long story short, in July and September, uh, needless to say, there was no air conditioning in these buildings. And uh, I had a little thermometer I hung at the head of my bed. And just about every night at midnight in July and se October, I'll get it right in a minute. In July and August, it was 90 degrees in there at midnight. I, I can remember uh, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, when I lived in Dallas, I can remember flying in to Dallas, the Dallas Fort right. Worth Airport, and getting there at 1 o'clock in the morning. It was 111 degrees. Right. Texas heat right. is, is, is something else. Uh, but, but the thing about San Antonio, you still got humidity down there, unlike Dallas. Oh, yeah. 
it's a uh, you know it's uh well uh john you've uh you've taken your experiences and uh, you've written well one book i think rice and cotton uh was your first book wasn't it rice and cotton south vietnam and south alabama was my first book now that's non-fiction and it was published in 2000. uh interestingly enough I started writing that in longhand on October the 10th, 1995, and I finished it on March 30th, 1996. Wow. I wrote every word of it in longhand, and about 80% of it I wrote out of doors. Right. Um, I wrote some of it right out here at the uh, South Alabama Regional Airport, Andalusia right. Airport, Heliport, because with respect to the book, Rice and cotton, uh, the cotton part's about growing up on a cotton farm in Dallas County, Alabama, right. and the rice part is about flying helicopters over rice paddies in Vietnam. Right. So when I wrote a good bit of the part, one chapter or a whole chapter about being wounded in Vietnam, I went out there and sat by the taxiway so I could hear those helicopters. Helicopter chop, rotors, chop, chop. yeah. yeah. Flucka to flucka to flucka to. But anyway, I uh, it's two books woven into one, and uh, one reason I wrote it was that uh, the mission I was wounded on was a debacle to say the least. It was a screw up of the major order. It was about 150 miles south of Saigon, a place called Kamau, which was just about off into the ocean. ocean it was so yeah. far south in Vietnam. They were in the South Delta then, basically. Right. And it was a, well, I won't go into detail, but it was just taking me, it was a major, major screw up. There were no news people there, none. No television, no Peter Arnett or anybody with mm -hmm. AP or nothing. And there had been a major blunder screw up again. The first one involving helicopters was uh, at a place called Opbach. And that was uh, January the 1st or 2nd, 1962, as I recall it. Now, were you flying those, those Sikorskys at that time or the... Uh the, we we call it the old banana. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's the H twenty one. Why? Right. It was the forerunner of the Chinook. Chinook. It was a tandem rover right. helicopter. Right. Okay. But Opbach was was there were news people there. Uh, Neil Sheehan wrote a book, A Bright Shining Lie, that's I've still a it. bestseller. Yeah. About Opbach. But I didn't want uh, the mission. It it was actually a place called Ken Long about. 10 miles north of Kamau, I didn't want to go, that to fall into the black hole of history Right. without somebody and who was there on the scene telling about it. All right, John, we're going to have to break for a second sure. uh, to sell a little advertising, and we'll be right back. I want you to pick up where you left off. Okay. All right, when we left a minute ago, John was describing a mission that he had gone on in the South Delta in Vietnam in 1964. Four, uh, in which he was uh, shot down and, and seriously wounded. Uh, we're lucky, you're lucky thank to be you, alive. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because the good Lord had plans for me and he saved my life. I, uh, I, and, and coincidentally, this, I don't even if you know, know if you know this, but uh, the Speed Channel several years ago did a, uh, uh, they're not even in business, but they did a, uh, a thing on the dust offs. Right. And they actually had filmed part of your rescue. I have seen that. I yeah, forgot and, about and, it. And I'd seen it, and then I, uh, on a, I have not been able to locate it since. But I know that I've, I've uh, been on uh, YouTube, and I'm kind of a historian. And uh, there was an article, not an article. Somebody had put together another film presentation, and they interviewed a young John Gavan about. Uh, uh, I think. Who was the guy? Who was a colonel that was a that would uh, do a that would fly literally into the gates of hell to get a guy out? He was Major Charles Ch Kelly. Charles he Kelly, yeah. Major. He's the yeah. one that met a vac me. Yeah, that's yeah. Oh, and, he uh, was a legend among legends. Yeah. Uh, he was incredible. Anyway, going back, you were talking about 
this battle, the botched battle right. that uh, they sent you into. I'm sure it was bad information, if any information at all. Well, it was uh, actually, and I've done a lot of research, and it's all in the book, it was the first time that the bad guys, the Viet Cong with North Vietnamese regulars, had operated at uh, the strength of three battalions, at regimental strength. I was going to say that's a regiment, And yeah. they overran a district capital down there uh, of good guys, district being the same thing as our county. Right. And, uh, well, actually our state, but anyway, they overran it and disemboweled the district chief and his wife and put the kids up on stakes and all this. Horrible. Yeah. And uh, we were sent down there without any intelligence at all as a, whatever you call it, get to get down there and take some troops. Quick That's reaction like, Yeah, force. quick reaction for it. Yeah. And uh, we had, on that mission, we had no artillery pre-strike. We had no Air Force pre-strike. We didn't even have any helicopter gunships covering for us, which was, and they sent six. That's just totally out of doctrine. They, they sent 16 of us, 16 helicopters, that's a crew of four, with good guy troops on it to let out in the landing zone. We landed right in the middle of three bad guy Battalions. Battalions, and buddy, they had themselves a dove sheep, yeah. and we were the doves. Uh, I, I had the opportunity uh, when I was in uh, working with a company in Atlanta. I handled marketing for everything from uh, in auto parts business from New Orleans over to the Atlantic and down to Orlando and up to Atlanta. And we were doing uh, some market work, and I ran into a group of uh, old. Arvin officers. That right. That were uh, 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 my, every one of them had a you know had a business there in Atlanta. The guy I ran into was running a very successful garage, and he had a couple other buddies he introduced me to. Well, every Saturday morning, they would get together, and they were guys. They were bookstore owners, uh, liquor store owners. Every one of them's kids were lawyers or doctors. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd come back and been I mean, no social problems or anything like that. But they would get together, and they invited me. It was an honor to go sit with those guys because these weren't people that were political. These were people that had been mud soldiers. Right. And uh, they would get together, and they would bring out the champagne and everything, and they would toast to their uh, fallen brothers, and then they'd uh, uh, get out the, uh, it was kind of like watching the, the story of Jesus when they get out the vinegar and the they'd bring out salt and the vinegar and have a, a, a ceremony and all. But uh, that was really touching, and it's a part of the conflict that I think most people don't remember because so much emphasis is spent on uh, our own involvement, uh, involvement, especially after the Marines went in at denying and then how it exploded exponentially from that. Uh, but you were there when, I know about, I guess not far from the same time Mark King was there. I was there a little bit before Mark. Matter of fact, at one time, Mark and I were I just like two ships passing in the night. Yeah. Uh, we both had the same commanding officer at right. one time, Major wow. Pat Delavan, who was a legend by himself. And, uh... But to, to tell you how early I was there, you keep in mind that there were... 58,000 plus Americans killed in Vietnam. Right. And I've checked this out carefully and I, I know it's a fact. If I had died the day I was wounded, I would have been the 47th American to die in Vietnam. Well, then there's a very high probability you would have been the first Alabamian. I, or and one I, of them. I've looked, I will, I've been meaning to look into this. Uh, and I don't know why I hadn't done it to see if I was the first Alabamian wounded in the yeah. Vietnam War. Maybe somebody out there can look and do that. Call the Auburn Library. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. You know, that's a, that's a place to find it. We need to break right now. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to Good News, Covenant County, with a, a special interview that we're having with uh, John Cavan, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, a great citizen in Andalusia, and 
uh, a writer, and we were talking about, we're going to talk about two of his books that he's been involved in right now. We're talking about the first book uh, of his. Hold it up. I shake too much. Sorry. Rice and Cotton. It was written about his time and as a young man in Safford, Alabama, and then as a young man in the Army flying helicopters in Vietnam. You can figure out where the cotton was and where the rice was. But it's available for sale. You can get it on Amazon. Just go to Amazon.com right? and you'll get it. And, uh, but it's by John B. Gavan, G-I-V-H-A-N. Now, just so you know this, and I'm trying to impress you and him with how smart I am, Gavan is an old Huguenot name. Right. And uh, there's a lot of them in the Carolinas, and then a lot of them came down through the uh, uh, vine and olive col colonies. And uh, Did you know they even made a movie about that with John Wayne in it called The Kentuckian? No, I didn't. Yeah, actually, go, he goes to Demopolis, Alabama. Yeah, I know about that. Linden and that neck of the yeah. woods. <laughs> But I've actually seen the movie. Now, that, that's a man that has too much time on his hands and not enough, you know. But I've actually, it's black and white. You know, this is, you may know this, may not, but as a quick aside, with respect to the Huguenot names, you know, if, if nine times out of ten, if I say Gavan, which is the way it's pronounced, people will say it's spelled G-I-V-A-N. Yeah. Okay, here's where the H came from. Back then, a number of the Huguenots inserted an H in their name so that other people would know they were a Huguenot. Well, I, that is interesting. I did not know that's that. where the H came from. It's uh, uh that's interesting. I uh, learned that from the Charleston, South Carolina Huguenot Society Library or something. Well, that's when I, you know, that's really when I was in college. My fraternity was founded in. In Charleston, Is that, right? yeah, that was a pie cap fine. Uh, went up to the a, a conference up there, and I fell in love with Charleston. Oh, yeah. You know, the old markets is a quaint town, beautiful. They've done a good job preserving it, and I, that's when I found out that was about 1970. Mm -hmm. uh, about the I knew about the Huguenots, but I knew about it mostly from Florida and Pensacola and and into Louisiana. But uh, that, and that's when. I really started reading about them. They paid a terrible price, many of them, to come to the United States. Well, there were just thousands of them that were persecuted and killed over in France yeah. because of the conflict with the other church. Well, I know that uh, you know if you go to Fort uh, to in Saint uh, in Saint Augustine, uh, that is uh, Fort. Oh, what is that name? Well, anyway, they've got a beautiful pentagonal fort there that was built uh, by the Spanish. And But if you'll go down south about, I think, seven or eight miles, there's a little outpost called uh, Matanzas. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a little bit. It's on the St. John's River. It was, it was a, an outpost south of there. And uh, the, the British used the uh, Huguenots as, as proxies for them in a lot of places. And they sent a... Uh, uh, a, a group of Huguenots to try to capture St. Augustine. And they landed them south. And they didn't know about, this is a long story made short, did not know about the fort. And so they, uh, they ran into resistance there and they were captured. And uh, they were tried on the spot and they, they took them and I think there were about 50 of them. This shows you how small the scale of the, the war was and took them one crossbow's length of a shot of one crossbow south of the uh, uh, fort at Batanzas and executed each one on by Garrity. Mm. Brave people. Now, they, you know, they, they, they knew what the consequences would be. But I, it's just interesting. We, don't, we have no grasp of a lot of that kind of stuff occurring in the United States. Uh, and, and, you know, that was before the United States, the United States, but it happened here on this land that you and I walk on every day. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll get back to uh, uh, what we were talking about. The, uh, Let's talk about the other book. Yeah. Uh, Hold that one up. This one here is also available in, uh, on Amazon, and this is The Blooms of Old Cahaba. Welcome back to Good News, Kevin and County. I'm John Jay. This is John Gavan. This is the John and John show today. 
And we're talking about some of the books that John's written. And we just spent some time talking about his first book, Rice and Cotton, a journal of his experience in South Alabama and in Vietnam. And now we're about to talk about a second book that he co-authored with uh, Judy Cooper, also a local person, uh, called The Blooms of Old Cahaba. Now, I've not read this one, John, so I... Uh, but but I, I do know what old Cahaba is. I've been there, and, and I'd like for you to just kind of take the story from there, if you don't mind. Well, this book is historical fiction, and you just have to read it. it blooms of old Cahaba. Uh, and let me digress at length to brag on my co-author, Judy Cooper. What a brilliant, talented, talented. lovely lady. Uh, the good Lord just ran us together about, oh, I guess 10 years ago. She has a book out of her on Designs in the Sand. Right. And uh, I hope I got that right. I think you're right. Designs in the Sand. And I, I read it a, year, a number of years ago, and I was halfway through that book, I'd, and I just said, I've got to contact Judy and ask her to co-author this book about Old Cahaba. And she did, and we did. We worked on it for off and on for 10 years. They were, you know, everybody's got their own lives to lead. Sure. We'd work on it a couple of years, and then something maybe come up in her life or my life or both of our lives, and we'd drop it for two or three years. But right. we finally got it finished. And uh, it's a delving into what it was like at Old Cahaba, which was the first capital of Alabama from 1820 to 1826, at the confluence of the Cahaba and Alabama rivers in Dallas County, County. Alabama. Uh, the Cahaba rifles, some less than 200 men, more than 100 men, left there to go fight in the Civil War, and I think five of them survived. Uh, but what Judy and I do is go back and visit uh, those days in Cahaba. She wrote some of the chapters. I wrote some of the chapters. One way we've kept this we, between ourselves, and this is, this is a bit funny, but it still helps, We've agreed not to tell anybody which chapters she wrote and which chapters I wrote. <laughs> uh, not interestingly enough, having coffee with a bunch of old folk, old fools, I should say, including myself, a couple of weeks you ago. Can, you can say fart on this. <laughs> no, I, that's not what I meant. Uh, I, one of them said to me, Boy, uh, he said, Mrs. Cooper really did a job on such and such a chapter. And I, and I, I thought to myself, well, I wrote that chapter, <laughs> but I didn't say anything to it. And we've had it go the other way too, you yeah. know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where somebody will say, John, you, you kind of, Really did a good job on that chapter, and it'd be a chapter Judy wrote. Right. So, but the book is uh, it can be ordered Amazon.com. Blooms of Old Cahaba. What time period does this book cover? This book covers. I'm gonna say roughly from 1815 to about. 1885. Okay. 1815. Yeah. To, one chapter in the book is about uh, a, a wealthy planter who was a bachelor uh, getting on a steamboat at Cahaba and going to, headed to Montgomery. Oh, my. To see his girlfriend. But when she got on the steamboat, there's another young lady on there with her mother who he pretty hooks up with. He was pretty smitten with. Yeah, smitten with. And uh, he was more smitten with her 
the one he met up with until the nice uh, steamboat happened to ram into a, a 30 degree log. oak tree log that was buried into a, a, a sand bed in the river. Yeah. And that broke up that romance. My goodness. But that just gives you a little hint as to what. So there's other... action and adventure and oh, romance. Oh, yeah. And... Oh, gracious, yeah. All that in there. Well, that's great. Um, I know you enjoyed writing it. You had to if you're going to stick with it. And some 10 of years. the stories, let me tell you, some of the stories about farming per se are actual things that happened to me as I was growing up right. on a large cotton farm. And I just kind of tweak this, that, and the other to make it a little bit more interesting, but mm -hmm. it's not something I just altogether dreamed up. Correct. Uh, so, and, and Judy, Judy was the same way. But anyway, it was published in January of 2017, and we uh, would appreciate it, and I think you'd like it, reading Blooms of Old Harbor. It's got a lot of historical fiction in it. The, uh, by the way, the, the front cover of the book is this antebellum home, or I don't know if it's correct to call it an antebellum home or not. This home uh, is the current residence of my cousin Sam and Sam. his wife Lynn Gavan. Yeah. Uh, this home was originally constructed in 1842 by the Pegues family. So that's probably an actual log cabin in the middle of that then. No, it was... Uh, it was stick-built then. It was stick-built, and they had resources, quote-unquote. I understand. They had the money, they had the timber, they had the logs from Bear Creek Bottom, and they had, obviously, they had the labor to do it. What, what, what wood they had to work with. I, I have canoed from up at Centerville down to Cahaba. And, and, uh, oh, man, have you? Yeah, and I tell you, the guy that's done it more than I have is Walt Merrill. I, I did it back 20-something years ago. Oh, I got to talk to him. And, and, but Walt's made that trip several times. Folks, I hate to do it. Gosh, this has been about as much fun as you can have with all your clothes on. But John and I have got to end this interview. We've just run out of time and memory on the camera. We thank you for watching with us. We look so forward to seeing you tomorrow. Take care. Have a great day. See you then.